Hey, it's time. Let's begin. Okay, we've reached the uh, top of the hour, so let's begin. Welcome to part two of the LAMPS Working Group. Next slide. As a reminder, we're working under the note well. Please make sure you understand your responsibilities before you contribute. There's a lot of RFCs listed there for you to look at. Please treat each other with respect all the time. Next slide. We went, we went through most of the agenda, to my great surprise, last uh, session. We are on this group five. F is the next presentation, uh, which is the last of the adopted documents we'll be talking about. And then we have these documents um, that the authors are seeking adoption. So perhaps we will be going a little slower as we go through these. Um, there might be more discussion. And we, and we have one additional we have one additional document uh, under consideration that we added during agenda bash. So we'll be doing Hannes's document at the end about the nonces. So there'll be a six E on CMP nonces. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to the presenter, Mike. <laughs> so you may recall that uh, in Prague, we had a cryptographic researcher, Falco, present a um, interesting attack that he found against uh, CMS and the next slide uh, summarizes it. Basically, the attacker um, intercepts a CMS authenticated envelope data uh, that uses either CCM or GCM, and they manipulate uh, the message considerably, eliminating uh, all of the authentication making it look like it was encrypted with a CBC and turns each block in the message into a guess um, and that sends that garbage on to the victim. And if there is a way that he can tell what the plain text is that that victim sees, then he knows he can find one of his guess blocks that works and that's enough for him to figure out the key. Um, I'm sorry, to learn the, bl the plain text of that block, <laughs> not the whole key. Um, and so he, this is important in highly structured messages like uh, password change messages or something where you say, and your new password is, <laughs> um, something like that. Um, next slide. So the mitigation is to, uh, in some way, bind the encryption algorithm identifier uh, into the key derivation function that involves three parts, assigning an OID for, that, for this new um, technique, um, and then advertising uh, it in a SMIME capability so people learn who uh, supports it and who doesn't, and then doing the encryption with a HKDF of the key that uh, all of the recipients have plus the algorithm identifier that is actually being used for the encryption thus where the binding occurs is in that uh, that kdf next uh, slide so here's an example of um, the cek that is produced by whichever uh, recipient info technique is being used um, it's got an aes GCM algorithm identifier, including a nonce. Um, so there's the, um, the two inputs are the algorithm identifier and the CEK itself. And the bottom line shows which uh, AES key comes out for the CEK prime. 
next example shows how uh, it works with CBC. <laughs> and um, so if you are using CBC, the technique works the same. Uh, next slide. So the uh, using envelope data as an example, uh, envelope data has this structure with the content, uh, encrypted content info with the bottom of the slide. The new OID goes into the content encryption algorithm identifier and the parameters for that new OID carry the actual algorithm that is being used. So if the actual algorithm was cipher block chaining, AES was cipher block chaining, the new OID goes at the top level and the parameters are the cipher block chaining uh, OID and the IV. Next slide. The um, content is then encrypted with the CEK prime and that's how the actual binding occurs. Next slide. This technique works uh, for uh, encrypted data and auth envelope data as well because they use the same structure encrypted content info. So you put the same OID in the same place in, in both of these other structures and then do the encryption or authenticated encryption with the new CEK. Next slide. Works all, with all of the flavors of <laughs> recipient info as well uh, because those each produce the CEK that goes into the KDF. Next slide. So the design rationale is pretty simple, that uh, avoid negotiation because in CMS, you don't have a round trip. You can't, you're not both online at the same time. So picked one, uh, picked HKDF with SHA-256. If the attacker removes this OID, then he will, then the recipient will not be able to do the decryption uh, because the, uh, key is different altogether, but at the same time, the recipient doesn't, uh, won't have the same garbage message that the attacker intended. Uh, so even if a block matches in any way, it won't be the correct garbage, I guess is the answer. Garbage being the word Falco used in describing it. Um, likewise, if the attacker changes the algorithm identifier in the parameter section, um, then the KDF will produce a different result. And again, the attack fails. Next slide. So in uh, Prague, we talked about a way forward that involved publishing an internet draft with this mitigation, assigning an early OID, uh, then gain some implementation experience, make sure this actually works and everyone uh, is getting interoperability. Once we're sure of that, publish a uh, standards track RFC with this and then update SMIME to use this technique. Um, next slide. We have the draft. Next slide. <laughs> Yesterday, we got the OID. <laughs> Literally yesterday. <laughs> so this morning I posted a new internet draft with the OID in it. <laughs> and next slide. So the next step is gain implementation experience. Mike Ellsworth, does your draft contain test vectors? Does the new OID change the test vectors? The OID does not change the test vectors because only the parameters go into the KDF. So the test vectors are correct. The only thing the assignment of the OID changed was the value that goes into the SMIM capabilities and that I updated. <laughs> okay, next slide. Ah, Daniel. That's the last slide, but we do have Dan in the queue. Sorry, this is the last slide? Yep. Okay. Um, I can't argue with the choice of HKDF. Um, I wonder if that affects what we're doing in CMS Skyrook, because now HKDF is required. Um, should we just change CMS Skyrook to always use HKDF? 
if, if it's going to be needed for the rest of CMS. Um, it'll be available, and I think that you need to think about what environment. Um, I can't think of a reason not to use it in every case. However, um, I, there might be environments where it's not where this attack is not possible. So, okay. um, I mean, the problem with with such a low level building block, right, <laughs> is is that uh, there might be environments where where it's not all that important. But at the same time, one HKDF invocation is not a huge overhead either. No, I'm not concerned about the overhead. Just that the fact that it has to be implemented now um, mm. means that for some of the logic for uh, for why we must use uh, KMAC at the CMS level kind of goes away. Anyways, I'll I'll think about. It. Thank you. So, are you suggesting that we would update CMS itself to all to only support this technique? Uh, I don't know if I'm suggesting that. I'm suggesting okay. that, so that, that seems like a heavier lift because <laughs> no, CMS is currently at full standard. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just wondering if CMS Kyber should remove KMAC then if this is going to be essentially required. But yeah, I guess we have to think about if there's cases mm -hmm. where this draft would not be required. Yeah. It, so, I mean, it'll take a couple of years if we want to update CMS and get it back mm -hmm. to full standard. Okay, thank you. Yep, Sean. Hey, Sean Turner, on the last bullet point, um, I've been in contact with Blake Ramsdale, who is the, uh, one of the other two co-authors, the, the third one, Jim Shaw, is deceased, about doing the RFC 8451 BIS draft, and we've already got that kind of in play. Uh, the biggest stumbling block actually was getting it from XML to Markdown. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to have something reasonable in a GitHub repo that'll be what was in 8551 and 8450, and then everyone can see what we changed on the way forward. So there's full transparency. Uh, and I hope to have that done soonish. Thanks. Cool. Who's next in the queue? John Gray. Yeah. Hello. Um, so I guess like existing CMS implementations should update with this mitigation. And if we hadn't previously supported HKDF, I guess now we need to add that as well. Is that, I guess that's what I, would need to do to make that my implementation. <laughs> yes. Okay. And, and uh, perhaps pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah. Okay. And I guess in terms of like interoperability in that, um, so I guess if someone has a mitigation and someone doesn't, then they're not going to be able to interop. Um, yeah. I guess. I guess. I guess. Uh, you said it'll probably take a few years for this to probably filter through all the implementations. And is that kind of what your best guess is or? Well, I don't know how long we, we need to wait um, in terms of gaining the experience before we publish the standards track RC. That's the question. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll have to put it on my list of to do's then. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike St. John's. Um, is pragmatic, it work, it'll work, but is it in the right place is the thing that I looked at because I keep looking at this and thinking this is a good place to the context field of the KDF later on would it be a better place for it on a more general ma manner across the board for a lot of things. So the reason I don't think that's the case is this to me looks like the sweet spot. Um, because it works across all of the content types and all of the recipient infos. If we move it somewhere else, we lose that. Like I said, pragmatic. I'm not <laughs> sure it's right, but. Yeah. Yes, pragmatic. <laughs> At this point, I think that's where we are. We have a, a very old spec. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we have Sean Turner next with the CMC drafts. Uh, 
Joe, sorry about that. <laughs> you can pretend. That would be difficult. You, you have to grow a gray beard really fast. <laughs> and, and, and cut my hair off. But that's okay. But one's easy, the other's hard. All right, next slide. Uh, so this is the slide we presented. Point in, to the mic. Uh, better. Uh, this is the slide we presented in Prague. Um, that was the work we did beforehand. Uh, I guess the one thing I'd point out is the motivation for the uh, doing this work in the first place was to remove SHA-1 and uh, process errata that were open. Next slide. Uh, here are some of the changes we just implemented. Um, we added a new uh, module, ASM1 module to support HMAC uh, SHA-2. Um, we removed TLS 1.0 and uh, replaced it with TLS 1.2. Uh, and then we noticed some inconsistencies in the introduction paragraph uh, between the, uh, uh, the agent types. So we went back uh, through the body of the draft and aligned it with the intro which uh, involve renumbering some of the, the section headers as well. Uh, our to-do, to-dos, uh, we're looking to add support for chem certificates. Uh, we mentioned that the other day. Um, we would like to add off envelope data as well. And we would like to, uh, update the cryptographic algorithm requirements section as well, which is uh, the, was part of the primary motivation of uh, starting this work in the first place. So an open question to the group would be, uh, so if we make SHA-256 the must and we remove SHA-1 completely, should we have a, uh, should we have uh, well a should in there as as a bet, as a option optional? Do you have a cue, Mike? Scott. A uh, quick question: You one of your changes is to replace TLS one point two with uh, one point zero with one point two. Is there a specific reason you didn't go all the way to TLS 1.3? Uh, no. Sean, you have a, okay. oh. a better, better response. <laughs> Sean, you have a better response. Uh, <laughs> say, yeah, say so if you look at the Utah BCP, it says you, you're you okay to keep doing 1.2. And if you're in, a, in, in an environment where you need to keep 1.3, you should prefer to do 1.3. So we're just doing what the BCP is saying. So I'm not trying to get in that fight. It's 1.2 or later. So knock yourself out. Yeah, yeah. Says the TLS yeah. working group chair. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask the same question. Um, but then I have another question. So anyway, the first question is answered. Uh, second one. For chem, um, so you mentioned you're adding auth envelope data, and then would you consider, I guess, the, the, the chem recipient info, I guess it's it's too new, it's not published yet, but if it gets published soon, you would potentially add that as well, I guess. That, uh, that If you'll read the draft, that's how they're doing it. Oh, it's okay. Well, <laughs> I haven't read it. That was just, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Scott was there. Yeah. <laughs> I need a phone book. Um, uh, Rich Saul Uh Yeah, keep it to just uh, reinforce what Sean said. Uh, what we see in a lot of traffic, I mean, 1.3 is winning, but there's still an awful lot of 1.2. And in fact, all of the payment industry and so on says 1.2 or later. You know, all the various other standards say 1.2 or later. Um, on the bottom line, the since SHA-256 is a must, do we need a should? 
No. Okay. Yep. yep. Awesome. John Gray, Composite Signatures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I get to talk to you about the version 13 updates today, and this is work we've been working on for I think it's almost five years now I was looking at our first version so anyway um, if you can go to the next slide I'll just describe what has changed um, so the first thing um, last time when we talked about the updates we had added this you know this uh, ASCII uh, dir encoded string which gives us um, which is concatenated with the message so that's been updated now to uh, a dir encoded oid it just makes it simpler and there's a nice table in the draft uh, which basically shows what those encodings are so no one has to guess and we don't expect people to actually do the encoding um, because they can just use what's written in the draft um, the second thing is we simplified uh, the number of pre-hashing algorithms so if you remember we do a pre-hash now since uh, version 10 um, we were doing a bunch of different ones like uh, shake and uh sha384 we just thought instead just remove those just use sha512 and then so we only have two now sha256 and sha512 so i guess lowers the, the number of algorithms needed um, the other smaller change is obviously because these are uh, backwards compatibility breaking changes we updated the prototype oids that are listed in the document um, because they're not compatible and then the last thing is we removed uh, Falcon FNDSA. So, and the reason we did that is, well, Falcon, the initial public draft has not been released yet, and we didn't want it to delay the release of this document. I mean, I mean assuming it gets adopted and all that, but um, we just thought we would focus on the MLDSA. So those are the changes affecting interoperability. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so this this just I've showed you this slide last time. Um, this just goes over the message generation process. Um, so we hash pre-hash the message, and then and step two is kind of where the the meat of it is. Uh, so we uh, take the dir encoded oid. So the reason I I highlighted that because that's basically the change. So we now we have a dir encoded oid that's concatenated with the uh, hashed message, the pre-hashed message, um, and you do that for both algorithms. Um, and then you get your signature. So that's essentially what I wanted to highlight. Mike, did you want to say something now? Hi, John, Mike Ellsworth. So I just want to highlight, this has come up in other working groups since we wrote these slides. If we want this mechanism to be common across multiple protocols, Jose, Jose, blah, 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 then a dare encoding of an OID as a domain separator is pretty CMS specific. So right now this is CMS specific. All, unless we want to sort of abstract out that the context string can be passed in, like just, you know. So this is Russ, I'd like to push back on that comment. Um, if you look at the internals of a PKCS1 version 1.5 RSA signature, mm -hmm. inside there's a NOID. Yeah. And basically, all the people who use it in context other than CMS just encode it as a uh, octet string goes here. <laughs> yeah, and in, in fact, the table we put here, that's where I got the motivation of putting that in there because of PKCS 1.5 does that exact same thing. <laughs> um, okay, thanks. So you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just the verification process. It's again just showing again the, it's the dir encoding of the OID that's concatenated with the uh, prehashed message. Um, so that's essentially the same. Um, just the the point at the bottom that was there last time as well. We're we're making it very clear in this document that the applications must output valid signature if and only if all component signatures were success, successfully validated. And invalid otherwise so it's an and mode and it's always an and mode you can't do anything to finicky with that so you can go to the next slide 
yeah, so this, I just wanted to show, this is the complete list of all the combinations. There's 13 of them. Um, some point, I'm not sure if it was between this and the last IETF, we did end up adding NLDSA 44 because we had people asking for that. So that's why there's five of those. Um, but as you can see, they're all MLDSA based. The first algorithm is for either 44, 65, or 87. And then we have the, uh, the combinations. So we have the brain pool curves, the NIST curves, um, the, uh, the 25519, and the ED448, uh, and then, of course, RSA. So, Mike? To the people in the room snickering at how long this list is, cool, tell us which ones we can take out. We'll gladly take them out. Yeah, and I mean, we did want to, I think when we initially started with this, we had five, and um, then, you know, people would come to us and say, well, we need to add this one, and we need we need brain pool curves because people in Europe want to use that, or in Germany, you know, so that's how it ended up the way it is. But it doesn't have Falcon anymore, so it is smaller than it was. So. <laughs> So I have a half. I have a question, which is kind of half a joke, and half not. Do you preclude using null? So MDSA uh, with null, and just use MLDSA. Is that the same thing then? So, so you mean just, have the second algorithm as a null? Nothing. Like a null algorithm? No. 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 There's no code point for it. And you, you, no, you, we're not advocating a null one. I mean, if you so really maybe want in it. Security considerations. We could say don't allow that to ever be and provide instructions to the designated expert to not allow such a thing. <laughs> that, that's all I'm saying. I'm okay. saying don't I mean, yeah, I mean, we can add that. We don't have a combination that would include that. And then, but yeah. But but yes, I see here you're saying we could say we never allow this for these. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Go ahead, Quinn. I'm Quinn Dang at NIST. Um, I am not recommending remove any of them. Um, um, but if the group want to remove some things or to make the list shorter, then I would recommend to uh, take out the uh, MLDSA 65. Keep only two options, the 44 and the, uh, the 87. Because 44 is really good, it's secure, it's good to use. And if somebody wants to be uh, compliant with, uh, with some other, um, you know, um, like NSA requirement or something, or something like that, then you need the, uh, the 87. That's how I would want my list to be shorter if I need it to be shorter. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would have thought you would have said take out the forty-four actually, <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're planning to. No, I, yeah, no, ahead. yeah, forty-four is good. I, yeah. Okay. It's like, um, yeah, forty-four is good. Or I would go with like for AS. AS would go for one twenty-eight and two fifty-six. And in this case, 44 is way more secure than AS-128. And so I have no reason to go for 65. The only reason they go for the 80, uh, 87 is at one level five for some other uh, uh, requirements, you know, somewhere else. And then I, I got to go with 80, uh, 87, then I got to go with that. But for, for security reason alone, I would go with 44. I don't have to, you know. To go anything to waste my performance on okay yeah well we'll take that comment into consideration of course um yeah i mean let's get this ado document adopted first and then oh we'll get to that um okay i yeah so you can go to the next uh, slide unless there's more comments just on a second john this is russ um i don't know that it affects anything but what you're trying to do with the places that you're using rsa is to pick a bit length um, that is the same as the uh, choice for MLDSA, right? Yeah. And yeah. But That's it true. actually yeah. doesn't. Uh, but there's nothing in the algorithm description that that forces that. So you could combine. Uh, 
the RSA one to just say use RSA, right? So what, which which RSA one are you talking about? The first one, for instance. Oh, I see what what you've done. Uh, no, I don't think it yeah, will get shorter. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Quinn, are you still in the queue? Uh, no, you're okay. electronically. You're still in the queue. Yeah, and I can't <laughs> because my online tool is down. Uh, ah, okay. I just want a, a, a quick note to Quinn. Uh, if you if you need to see a CNSA 2.0 compatibility, you don't use composite. You use straight uh, M, uh, MLD uh, DSA 87. That's correct. Jonathan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, Jonathan Hamill, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, so, uh, in the interest of shortening the lit, uh, shortening the the list, do we need the RSA PSS uh, versions? Because I think the argument for including RSA was for old existing code, and how much of that was migrated to P PSS? Um, that's just a question. I mean, I, I think that's a good comment. I mean, I know a lot of people don't like PKCS 1.5 and, you know, let's say it's even broken and stuff like that. So that's why we added PSS. But I mean, well, so uh, one comment on that, uh, the, the inclusion of RSA is not compatibility with existing code, it's providing the floor. So it's more of an argument of what do you want for your floor? And I don't know what the answer to that is, but it doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with what's implemented out there today. Well, I, I, I mean, I know, you know, people that we've talked to that are like RSA shops, when they see this, they're like, oh, yeah, we want to use the RSA one because that's what we have and we know it and we trust it. And, you know, we know we're going to have to new, add new stuff, but I'm not sure we trust the new stuff. So we want to keep using our RSA. So that's, <laughs> that's yeah, one of the I, reasons why. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here is Guilin from Huawei International Singapore. Uh, can you please go back your uh, proposal about the construction of, uh, of the signatures, composite signatures? Are you asking me go to go back, back a slide? Go back up, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, here, here is the great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so my question is this one, is it possible to consider to save the time so hash uh, is used? Actually here is for this one, if we have two component signature schemes, basically you will still have to do three types of hash, right? First, get an M prime. Then actually for S1, S2, you still need to do another two times hash because uh, like the algorithm ID combined with the M prime, it will be treated like a new message. So still need to do a hash, right? Yeah, depending on yeah, depending so on the algorithm, yes. Yes. I'm considering whether it's possible we just hash one time. For example, like you to generate the M prime, we just combine two algorithm identify together with the message, then get the M prime. Then just a side M M prime. No more uh, hash hash like this. Yeah, so it doesn't give someone's talking in the room. Can you go to the mic? Yeah. Please? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, but security, I'm not sure. I'm uh, just thinking about the. Yeah. Uh, sorry, MLD, uh, MLD, account of like ML, like DSA, uh, for it requires a hash with a specific prefix on it, and that's fixed in the algorithm. Mike Ellsworth, yeah, there's only two hashes involved here there's the M prime hash, and then there's the um, RSA with SHA-2 or the EC with SHA-2, the yes. MLDSA does not have its own hash. So there's only two, not mm -hmm. three. And if you do what you're proposing, I think where you pull the dare, dare of the OID up to the first line, then you don't get the non-separability property because they're both signing the same message. And, and we had considered what uh, Gilan is asking. We had, we had considered that, right? We had our authors group had numerous discussions about well do we only want to have one hash throughout the whole thing and then you know if you're using rsa or ec then you could do this kind of thing well you've already pre-hashed it and do this but then i mean it's a hash right hashes are cheap <laughs> so why not just do it again and keep it simpler right okay we're, we're going to uh close the queue at this point um 
so that we make sure we have time for other presentations. Yeah. Rowan May, um, on the table of the table of composites, uh, it occurred to me that in many IANA registries, for example, we have uh, a field. Could you go to the table slide, please? Ah, sorry. I, I don't much care, but it may help comprehension. Yep. Uh, in many registries, there is a recommended column. And so it might be, this might be a good time to introduce something like that and say for all of the RSA and brain pool things to say not recommended. Because we're kind of like doing these because we think some people might do them, but we don't actually want them to do, to do that. And please go ahead. We had a recommendation column in here four drafts ago. We took it out at popular demand because CMS doesn't because really work that way. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I guess it's I guess it's me. Um, I'm responding to Tim's comment about PSS. Um, it would be really stupid if you support PSS and then have to go down to PKCS one to do the migration. That's true. Okay. Yes. Uh, John Price Matson, uh, for the last row, which uses MLDSA and ED448, both of these uh, use shake. Wouldn't it make sense to use shake as the prehash? So we did have that the previous version before this one. We actually did have that. Um, again, we're doing the prehash before. Uh, so you, I mean, yeah, you, then you'd only have one hash algorithm. So we did have that. We thought, reducing the pre-hash would potentially simplify that. And also depending on what level your, your um, crypto library, like if you have an implementation of the ED and say you're getting in a separate library, but the code where your composite is doesn't have that, then it's something else that you have to implement. But Mike, you had a comment on that too. Yeah, can you go back to the table please? <laughs> Poor chair. John, all the pre-hashes are shot Two. These are all SHA two prehashes, right, John? Well, no. What's well, SHA two? Yeah, SHA two or yeah, two fifty six. So yeah, yeah the prehashes are all SHA two. We don't want SHA three at this level. Right. That's so all. I'll echo John's comment into the mic. So we're, yeah, with the, the, the debate here is what, what do you have access to at the crypto layer or what do you have access to at the CMS layer? The composite is happening at the layer of the CMS library. And so are we introducing a SHA-3 dependency at the CMS library? And is that different than introducing it at the crypto library? This is the debate we've been having back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> but I mean, if the group decided, no, we want this, I mean, we could, we could add it back in like we did have it before. So. We're gonna, if we go down that route, we end up doubling the number of voids because we have the SHA-2 and SHA-3 pre-hashed versions of every one. We can do that, we can do it. Chris Kwiatkowski. Um, step back, I think a little. Uh, I'm still, it's still unclear for me why composites are, like what's the use case really? Well, is it alternative to, to Sphinx Plus or like, is, is the use case here, if I can't have very long signature, then I will go for that? Or, or does, is there any other, some other use case? Yeah, I mean, so you're asking what the use case for it is? Like, so like a long lived signature, I mean, that's one case. Um, if you don't fully trust like the MLDSA or the implementations, that's another reason. Um, but yeah, okay. But if I don't trust MLDSA, shouldn't I go for just? I mean, I, I heard in the Open PGP group today, even the authors of MLDSA have said to use it in hybrid. So this is one way of doing that, right? Even the biggest one on this list is still smaller and faster than Sphinx. Ah, so <laughs> so that's, that's the use case, right? The, the small, small signature. Well, that I mean, that's one. Yeah, there's a number of them. Okay, John, I've closed the queue. We've now exhausted the queue. Please move on with your presentation. Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, it's not actually, there's only 12 slides. Can you go to the next one, please? Only 12. <laughs> yeah, so the next, I just have a couple slides and numbers. So I was saying in version 10 or previous to version 10, if you remember, we had changed, the, it was a sequence of subject public keys. Um, now it's a, a sequence of bit strings for the public key. And this slide is just showing, I just took a couple of them. It just shows that there was a savings, right? So the public key size, you say 41 bytes or 42, depend, depends on which algorithm. And in a certificate, um, the other thing we removed, right, with the uh, 10 and later, we removed the parameters, right? All the parameters are specified in the OID. So you actually save that. So this is just showing that I basically I ran some numbers. I've generated these things. And yes, you do. There was some real savings. So I just wanted to show that. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this slide is interesting because I wanted to compare Okay, if you have you know a peer MLDSA subject public key, and now you have you know your MLDSA composite key, um, depending on the algorithm, what is actually the difference in the size, right? Because, I mean, for the assurance that you get by adding the two together, right? So, um, it's not actually a lot of overhead. If it's EC, you get like you know five point eight percent or whatever, seventy seven bytes. RSA, there's a little bit more, but this is just showing that. You know, with actually generating these things, it's not it's not a huge overhead actually to do that. Um, so, I mean, if you get that extra assurance, then why wouldn't you do that? Um, so, go to the next slide. I did the same thing for a certificate, just for comparison the size. Um, and the certificate used was just you know like the, the the template of the certificate was the same for all of them. So the overhead isn't that much either. So a pure MLDSA certificate. And then, you know, you add MLDSA with, you know, one of the composites, right? Um, so the, the overhead isn't that much. And the one point, which was mentioned earlier already, but even the largest of them is still smaller than SLHDSA, right? So, um, so yeah, so that, that's just some numbers I ran just to, to show people the overhead is actually not a lot. Go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is going over the editorial changes. So we did change the name. It was uh, we changed it to Composite MLDSA for use in Internet PKI um, because we removed Falcon and yeah, this is more specific to MLDSA. Um, we removed ambiguity and made it clear all component signatures must be verified. So that was some comments from the last IETF. Um, we added language to ensure that all component keys must not be used in any other context. So when you generate these things, they should be freshly generated, just like you would generate any other key. So the components key should be freshly generated. You shouldn't have, you know, another shirt that has one of these by itself and then have these, like you must not do that. Um, we fixed the AS in one module. Um, Russ, I think you're the one that found this, our PK composite signature didn't compile. So anyway, we fixed that, it compiles. Um, we shortened the abstract and we added justification text to where and why this mechanism would be used. Um, so you can read that. And uh, we resolved comments from Chris, who was actually just asking questions, Tim Hollenbeek and Falco. Um, we added a security consideration second section about trust anchors. Um, and we actually updated the samples to conform to this draft and, and fix it. So go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and there was a couple, Chris did actually, thank you, Chris, for um, already commenting on version 13. So he had some questions regarding the FIPS section in Appendix B, which our authors group will address in the next update. And Chris had also noticed that um, my I, I had a typo on the ASN1 module for Falcon, and I spelled it Fallon. So when I was trying, when I was ripping it out, I didn't notice, and that little piece remains. So I will definitely fix that in the next update. So thank you, Chris, for those comments. And uh, yeah, so if we go to the next slide, which I think is getting close to the end. Yes, so the, the elephant in the room, um, the call for adoption. So we have gone through the comments from pre-17, um, IETF 117, and also addressed the comments from 118. We believe we addressed all objections. So we clarified the scope and added justification text for jurisdictions which are intending to use composites. Um, we also collected additional use cases and support testimonials, and that's in the draft we are a P, uh, PQIP use cases draft. Actually, I think it might be at version one now. I guess I didn't 
I should have updated that. Sorry about that. Um, but that's in the PQIP working group. I re we removed the Falcon to focus on MLDSA um, so that once the MS MLDSA is standardized later this year, so we don't want to hold up the draft. Um, yeah, and we uh, make use of the non-separability property, which is discussed in the, the, the PQIP hybrid signature spectrums draft. Um, this other one is we have a lot of people implementing this and wanting to use this. So in our uh, in, in our hackathon, for instance, we have people from Open SSL, well, one of, a person from Open SSL. Um, Bouncy Castle is an interesting story because in our um, GitHub repository, just we had an issue up here that you know the the art uh, the samples in the draft were not functioning properly. Um, and that's because Jan Picky, sorry if I if you're on, sorry if I mispronounced your name, but from the University of Luxembourg was was implementing this, right? So anyway, we did interop testing with him, and um, so thanks to him for for pointing that out and uh, getting those samples up to date. But it just shows that I mean, people want to use this; um, they're implementing this without us even knowing about it. And you know, David Hook, who's actually I think in the room there, um, was. He got a pull request from Jan and uh, is, is probably going to implement um, integrate that into Bouncy Castle. We have Crypto Next provider, Digicert, Botan, and Trust, and others. Um, and this past hackathon over this last weekend, a lot of us are updating that to this version 13 as well, because it's been kind of in a bit. We've done it like two years ago, but um, now everyone's kind of consolidating on version 13. And then the last item is um, I was just in the open PGP working group before this and you know they had a bunch of proposals and they did have two composite combinations in there um, and they're moving ahead with that so I don't so anyway this is the reason why we want to do the call for adoption okay so I'm going to do a raise of hands whether we uh, whether you agree that this is ready for a call for adoption Okay, the numbers seem to have settled. So here they are. 24 think it's ready. One thinks it's not. 12 don't care. <laughs> so um, does the one who does not want to come to the queue and say why? No pressure. Just if you want to share, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so based on this, uh, after this meeting, we will do a call for adoption. Great, thank you. Okay, now we're going to talk about hash based signatures. There he is. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so next slide, please. To quickly recap, this is about hash based signatures for X509, mostly because we know several agencies, trust centers, and also industry who want to use it. So, mostly as kind of a, just a key format for code signing, but there's also some who want to have like a root CA based on hash based signatures. And next slide, please. So you can not only find uh, our drafts on the data tracker, but we also have a GitHub repository. They can also have like pull requests and also comment. But of course, feel free to comment also on the list. Next slide, please. So the major change that we did was uh, to split uh, the document into two. So basically, there's now one document for stateful hash-based signatures. 
which is stricter and where of course we talk about all those uh, key management issues that you have to take into yeah that you have to take care of and then there's basically one uh, document only talking about things plus or slh dsa and this is where we don't have to be that strict and yeah so this is what we had discussed at the last lambs meeting next slide please um, we've also done some minor changes as well so there was a bug fix thanks for to russ for spotting that we've also done some proofreading sanity checking we try to track the alignment to other documents who do similar things and again we think there's only minor issues left so far next slide please and a few days ago the call for adoption was started on the list there were some positive uh, comments so far and we kindly ask for your support so thank you and of course again if you have anything to tell us please let us know so uh please state your opinion on that mail list thread that's going on about adoption um, to be clear um, if we adopt both of the documents the first one is ready to go because the object identifiers are already available for um, hss lms but we would need to see um, void assignments for xmss which we can do and uh, but we will wait on the sphinx document for NIST to publish their document and give us the OIDs that will go in it. Makes sense? I see no one in the queue. Oh, there's somebody. Um, that, does it include the Chris Kwiatkowski? Does, it in, does this include the smaller parameters for Spain mix? Yeah. Nope. Okay. Next presentation then. Thank you. No slides, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. That's what I thought. We get it. Yeah. <laughs> this this one. Is, hi, I'm Rowan May. Um, this one is pretty simple. Um, when you want to put a instant instant messaging URI of some kind in a certificate. Some people want to do that and don't want to use one of the existing default key usages and then also accidentally start issuing certs for uh, DNS names for TLS. So hence uh, I am extended key usage. Uh, the draft is about as short as it could possibly be. Uh, since um, since 01 was submitted, there were two uh, there was a two character typo discovered and a one character typo discovered, which I've already fixed in the editor's copy of the of the document. Uh, so, um, what do y'all think? Does anyone think it's a bad idea to assign an extended key usage for instant messaging? Okay, then we'll do a call for adoption of this document. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thomas, you're up. How much time do we have left? How many minutes do you have? Speed up. Okay. Okay. So that Few minutes either a few minutes or a lot of minutes okay okay we don't know how much how long i have okay no. so mike you have 30 minutes 30 minutes yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we really have to go back in time to understand this <laughs> <laughs> i sound like john clancy uh, um 
some may understand what that I'm talking about. But um, use them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Mike spoke about the uh, remote attestation for the CSR in various presentations already. Uh, so I assume some familiarity with the subject. Um, and next slide. And the CSI itself, as you know, is a kind of a one-shot message. And the to provide this evidence in a container, um, there's often a desire to provide some form of free protection. You want to ensure that the evidence, the attestation evidence that is provided by the lower layers of the device is fresh. In some cases, not you don't need to. Uh, you don't require this in all cases, but in some, you may need that. Or it may be desirable to do so. And the RATS architecture um, outlines three ways to provide that freshness. Uh, the first one is having a timestamp. The second one is having an epoch value. And the third one is to use a nonce, a random value that is provided by the party that verifies the attestation evidence. And that's uh, sort of copy and base uh, from the CSR document, which obviously discusses this issue. Uh, it came up in a design team meeting, but it's outside the scope of, uh, of that, the CSR attestation document, rightfully so. So it says uh, it's up to the developer, uh, protocol designer and implementer to pick the right mechanism if you need, so, if you need this uh, feature. Okay, next slide. And the, what we did here with this document is um, it's the obvious uh, mechanism is to, if you want to use a non-spaced uh, uh, freshness mechanism, is to use a certificate management protocol in which the CSR is maybe included uh, to provide such a, uh, this nonce value first to the device it then passes that nonce value when it asks for attestation evidence into the API call. And this lower layer uh, returns then this, the attestation evidence in the format that is uh, defined. So there, there are different uh, technologies available. At the hackathon, we looked at the way how DPMs um, use attestation evidence. There, there's another example in the, uh, in the CSR attestation draft that uses the ARM PSA. Uh, attestation token. And so uh, those mechanisms define on how they take a, a nonce as input and then produce um, sort of attestation evidence that includes that nonce and thereby provide freshness. So that's what the, the document does. It, it basically defines messages to carry, request the nonce, and then get the nonce, and then subsequently pass those. Uh, um, the CSRs around that includes this evidence. And we, in this version of the document, we focused on two um, protocols, namely CMP, the Certificate Management Protocol, and ESD. Um, we have to start somewhere, right? Uh, so next slide. And if you care about a little bit more details, um, unsurprisingly, uh, ESD and CMP are different. So to convey those messages, you need to have different ways. Um, you see for ESD on the right-hand side, uh, we created a new um, sort of API, sort of the, the interfacing there is using a, a RESTful API, REST API, I should say. And so that's a nonce request and a uh, request and a nonce response. Um, the payload sign coded in JSON, application dash JSON. And for CMP, it looks different, uh, but uh, you see the details here, the semantic is the same, just a different encoding in, in a sense. So the request contains information about the length of the nonce that is requested because it depends on the attestation technology. Different attestation technologies have different um, sort of have constraints on how long that nonce is. Uh, uh, is. Uh, so that's just the way how they were designed. And then um, there's a response back on how that, how long that nonce is valid, including the nonce, of course. Okay, next slide. And then I'll have Mike. 
Mike Jones to ask a question. I think that's actually then my last slide anyway. Um, Mike. So um, this is a missing component in the work we're doing with the CSI at the station. If someone wants to or doesn't have the possibility to use, uh, for example, a timestamp, um, and but still wants to have freshness with uh, at the station evidence in a CSR. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Mike St. John's. Um, go back a slide, if you would, please. Okay. Uh, um, I would add to this and think about how you're going to carry it in the CSR a nonce ID. One of the problem. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is that sometimes that you know it may not it may not be something they keep around. They may just generate it or trying to pair them all up. Sometimes is a pain in the ass. So yeah. just a thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's true. Um, one thing from the uh, not this hackathon, but the Brack hackathon was um, a point we were wondering, and that's maybe a detail. Uh, later on is the question about denial of service resistance, specifically if you're not um, using, or if you don't want to allocate state at the, for example, RACA at the time when you uh, request a nonce from the verifier and you basically have a large number of people asking, you need to keep exactly that state around. You need to open a connection to a verifier. Presumably you have a number of connections already, but you need to at least create a store mapping between uh, a session between the session to the verify and, and the interaction with a specific device. So you need to, there's some state in essence. And uh, luckily uh, we have designed uh, DOS mitigation techniques to deal with this, but um, so like tickets in, or not, a, did we call it ticket? Yeah, in, in, in the DLS, uh, this, um, the, um, yeah, some RSC, I forgot the number. Um, where we had this sort of construction so that you not a server side, you don't keep state, you basically outsource it to the, to the device, but it uh, also requires some form of storing some identifier too. So good, good point. So not uh, ready for a working group last call yet, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, with the second version, we changed the design totally from compared to the first version uh, based on the hack last hackathon experience. Um, so here we are. Uh, hi, Sean Turner. So the flaw in your slides is you don't have the one which is one way you ad uh, adoption call. So I have a great idea. Sounds like a great plan. Is there any reason why you didn't do the other enrollment protocol? Um, it was it was purely I so would you be willing to accept text that uh, adopted such text? Oh, totally, like, totally. So, so you'll carry my water for me. You know, I, I, so <laughs> I. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really it was so. It was I don't have so this is probably yeah. a, a no go in this group anyway. If you say oh you have a preference for A or B, um, but uh, uh, Hendrik is obviously deeply familiar with CMP. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I I. Um, I know ESC uh, reasonably well, so that seemed like a, a reasonable thing to start with. Yeah, and I think then maybe the nice thing about this draft is you don't have to pick a mandatory to implement. It's like if you do one of the enrollment protocols, yep. you pick which one, so yep. you don't have to specify specify one. So if you were to add a third or whatever other one we come up with, it still fits. So great, yep. I'll help you with some text. Okay, thanks. I support adoption, though I don't know what he's asked for yet. So Sean, you're doing text for EST. Doing what? <laughs> text for EST? Yeah. Yeah, sure, if we need it. I thought you were doing CMC. Oh, CMC, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've got him. <laughs> Blame it, chat lag. Uh, thanks, Dan Harkins. Uh, so in EST, the uh, challenge password is the TLS unique value from the uh, TLS establishment. So why is that not fresh enough? Why do you need to pass this? Why do you need an additional nonce? Um, it's to the wrong party. It's, it's what? Right, it's, that's true. It's to the wrong party. Yeah, this is that the nonce comes from the verifier um, and not from the, not from the RACA okay. so, ESD server. So this, this also requires the attester to, to initiate this, right? What if the attester doesn't, do nonce request, but the 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 relying party and the, the verifier require uh, a nonce. 
did they refuse it? I mean, you, you could put the nonce in like the, the CSR attributes. Uh, sure. Yes. You could. Yeah. And, and just, uh, he, he doesn't ask for it, but just say, I, I want you to put this nonce in, the, in, your, in your CSR. We, we used a different approach previously where, where we overloaded a, an existing message. This was the zero, zero draft version. Uh, and then we did the hackathon um, sort of work and there um, it, didn't, it didn't play nicely to overload the, the existing messages. We picked one implementation, it was an, uh, a little bit of a nightmare. So we switched that um, together to, uh, well, switched the approach to an independent message because it allowed us to have uh, basically this two-way communication to pass information there on like what uh, size of the nonce do we need because of the attestation technology and also uh, we added a hint for example if, if uh, the device uh, knows what type of evidence um, attestation verifier it has a relationship with uh, because it then because there's you need did you read the uh, rats architecture document no. no. Okay. <laughs> that explains a few things. Um, <laughs> um, there is, so it's actually, I think that would be uh, a good document to read because it explains on the party, the interactions between the different parties. It explains the passport mode versus the okay. um, background check model um, and also the different freshness mechanisms. But in general, like it would be possible to stuff the exchange into different payload, into different existing messages um, and that's the version we have for right now if there's a better message we should stick it into I'm I'm fine I don't I don't care okay. actually. all right thank you one message for me is as good as any other yeah, maybe Hannes to add on that we started can you hear me yeah. we can yes. hear you Ah, thanks. Um, we started with this um, overloading the CSR um, attributes request or in the CMP version, uh, this uh, CMP, um, this request template, CSR template message. But um, we found like it is interesting for the RA to know which verifier to request nonces from. And there may be cases where you want to have a key attestation as well as a platform attestation. And therefore, um, it, it may, of course, be an RA policy to decide which um, evidence to request in a CSR. But maybe it is also some input from the um, and entity needed uh, to know which kind of nonce uh, to provide. And therefore, we, we changed this architecture to a specific request response message. Thanks, Henry. Usama? Yeah, Usama from TU Dresden. So I was wondering if, uh, that uh, that uh, draft is going to be limited only to TPM and ARM PSA. Uh, the reason I'm asking is that for trusted execution environments, this is going to be very useful where we do not have trusted time. And I can, I can uh, see that's a valuable contribution in that context. So two questions, whether it is out of scope or is it just that you want to use this as a starting point, and then it might be extended over to these where I see more value for this draft. Yeah, yeah. The the two examples I provided with the TPM and the um, the ARM PSA were really just examples, illustrations. Uh, so it's not limited to those technologies. So it would be would work perfectly fine also on a on any other attestation technology. Cool. Thanks a lot. Ned Smith, I have, a, I guess, as a scoping question. So I believe you showed a slide where we're using the background check model for the verifier through the CA. And and the expectation is the nonce originates from the verifier, flows through the CA. Uh, are you, does this draft intend to define how that nonce flows from the verifier to the CA? Um, I, so far, I didn't, a single word on on that aspect into the document um haven't even thought on who would be defining this other interface i naively have, was assuming that this would be done already in rats somewhere in a document that i haven't uh, read yet 
The Maybe I'm. The rats, <laughs> you the rats, just accused him. <laughs> <laughs> the rats charter says that they have they they make deference to existing protocols. Okay. So, so I, maybe something to think about. Yes, yeah, it's, it's implementable good, yeah. if there is no definition for how the nonce gets from the verifier. Yeah. And whether it's in scope for this group to define it. Good. Good question. Uh, in the in the hackathon work, we just used the API that was available uh, from Verizon because that we use that as a verifier. But you're right; it's uh, there's a question about the standardized protocol to have a completely interoperable solution to be done. Okay. Uh, Good. Anyone else? All right. Then we've exhausted our agenda. Um, do, uh, no, it's just do we, uh, or will you ask uh, about the call for adoption at some well, point? Well, you didn't ask for one. Uh, last slide. That was the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> or he asked, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yes, would the minute taker please remind the chairs to do a call for adoption of this document? I can do that. Okay. Let's say sit down and I'm a minute taker again. Um, there's a comment in chat that I want to echo from Dan Harkins, Hannes. Uh, does this presume that the attester knows which verifier he's asking for a nonce from, and does it need some signaling mechanism so the oh, RA can choose the correct verifier? Uh, say, say that again. Uh, does the verifier know which attester? No. The, if the attester is initiating this request for a nonce, mm -hmm. and the RA then has to figure out which verifier, if it has multiple configured, which verifier it's going to ask for a nonce from. So yeah. that, does that need a signaling mechanism? Okay. But that actually okay. requires a naming convention for all of the attesters. Yeah, and, and verify. That's, he was saying that there was possibly multiple verifiers that could be issuing these nonces. Yeah. Right. And that means that it assumes that the attester knows who he wants to ask a nonce for him. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. he's, and he's got to say, I want it from yeah. who. So, right? so, here's, so that's a question I asked on the rats mailing list, um, which the architecture was supposed, in my opinion, uh, the architecture document was supposed to answer. Um, and I, I don't think I got a satisfactory answer uh, to, my, to my question. In the CSI attestation document, we um, address this by including a hint that indicates which verifier to talk to, um, which I basically use the same approach. But that's after the attestation. In, you so the, the, the attester uh, I guess has some API to talk to the underlying hardware to the attestation service. Uh, and so it gets um, it gets some of that information. So it needs to get information about like who should I actually talk to. Uh, it it's sort of like maybe I need to state those assumptions um, more clearly. Uh, another update to be done. Um, but that's sort of the model. That's why I had this hint in there, which maybe hint is also not the the right term, but um, to indicate like a preference from the a tester on which verifier to talk to. It's so not it's, a. Yeah. So you have already included a hint in yes. the NOTS request? Yes. Uh, go if you go. Oh, yeah. well, then, well, then that's the answer to the question. It's the signaling mechanism Dan's asking for is already in there. Hmm? It's this one. So you see hint over there? Hint indicates which verifier to request a nonce from. That's what you're asking for, Dan, right? Yes. So the, the answer is the answer is it's already I, there. I shamelessly copied from the CSI at the station. Mike St. John's again. Um, you don't actually have to have the verifier request the nonce. Sorry, the yes, uh, you, relying you. party requests the nonce from the verifier. In many cases, for attestation, it's just generated externally. The question is who's re who cares about it? In this particular case the relying party could generate the nonce based on this is for a TPM, I know I need a nonce of this length, or this is for X, I need it for this length. 
and then just provide it as part of the additional data for the verifier. Mm. So it's, it, I, since yeah, you this is a protocol between mm. the relying party and the request, uh, the attester, you probably don't want to actually go deeper than that if you can avoid it. Yeah, and that, that would be more convenient for me to sort of side, sidestep that discussion altogether. Um, there's, a, you're right, there's a possibility to say like I chunk out the block and the, the RACA uh, or the ESD server, for example, has a certain uh, range of non it conduce or whatever. Uh, and so to in, or it wouldn't verify the most like or in this, the RATS architecture, the relying party, which is, for example, the ESD server, wouldn't by itself verify the uh, attestation evidence and instead would, it would delegate that task to the verifier. But um, how close the relationship between the verifier and the um, relying party is, is, is of course up to a deployment. It may be just a separate uh, library on the same machine, a microservice, or it may be a completely separate uh, server that is operated by a third party and then um, it may get uh, more tricky. So you need to request the, the nonce from there to indicate like the verifier needs to somehow figure out, is this actually current? Is this recent uh, information I got? No, the verifier only the verifier is only answering the question, I'm handing you a blob of data. Does this result, what's the key that it's applying to or what's the thing that's being attested that it applies to and is it valid? So the, the chain of certificates is external. The external the external data for the TPM, which is the nonce we're talking about, is external. So just providing that across that link, the relying party should be doing the management for that. And the and the verifier should just basically say, here's what you need as input data. Mm. Go to go to your next slide for a second. The hint there should not be about the verifier, but about the type of attestation that you're asking for a nonce for. So it it it's a class, not a not an end, not an end thing, and then that way you can manage the the nonces at the relying party, without having to worry about oh I've got five different TPM verifiers. Except you don't really get five different TPM verifiers. So. It, it, I think uh, I like your questions, but I think the right group to answer those is really the rats group. Uh, to be honest, I don't. There, there may be some changes in the in the in the fields here following the discussions with the uh, with the RATS group. So there's definitely this is this type of work similar to the CSI attestation where there's some collaboration between the two groups needed to answer some of those questions because they are more generic in nature and involves some of the way how ways how um, companies have implemented the the verifiers and they, how they want to deploy that technology. Um, I've only worked with the um, with the Verizon verifier, uh, but Ned, you have you have your own verifier for Intel, and so I think we need to exchange uh, information on how um, each of those parties, each of those companies, actually planning to deploy this whole system. Yeah, it it would be interesting to find out that the verifier is generating the nonce. It would be it would make your mechanism. You would actually now have to define a special protocol across that link, which you haven't had to do before. You're basically just asking a question and getting an answer. Right. So, so in this case, like the, um, I we in the hackathon stuff, we use the very some verify. It actually has a RESTful API. You open up a session, you get a nonce, uh, and then it waits um, till you get the evidence, and then you basically pass in that information. But it more homework to be done. Okay, but now I'm really done. <laughs> I should have told him he only had 10 minutes. <laughs> Mike Ellsworth on behalf of Carl Wallace. Okay. Um, so the hint, you've got the hint in the request, and then the hint is in the evidence. Mm -hmm. Does it need to be in the response so that the attester can echo it from the response into the evidence? Good question. Um, Isn't that the point? 
in the response in the in, in which response in the in the nonce response are you talking about the nonce response you want to have the hint in the nonce response or in the no, response goes, in the evidence it goes in, in the evidence. it is in the evidence in the csr it's in the, in I, the it's in the evidence and in 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 our CSR document. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm Carl. So Wallace. which response? I don't know if Carl wants to come online to make his own point, but yeah, in your 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 not response object there, that the hint is not there. Should it right. be a response? As we have a sequence of um, nonce requests and nonce responses, would be good to to have also either the hint in the response or as um, Mike proposed to have an um, an ID of the the nonces, mm. so to to match properly. Mm. It up. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Just my, might make it easier. The attester can then just, just echo the value into the attestation. Doesn't have to keep state. Yep. or Whatever. That's true. Depending on the type of evidence, the format that's in use, the the um, evidence format might include a nonce. So consider the e token, for example. Yeah. Second. No, you meant hint. He talked about nuns. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 So I have one wrap-up item. If we're finally done with nonsense. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we have a uh, working group last call going on for. Uh, draft IETF LAMPS OCSP nonce update. That was, um, we, it created a whole bunch of comments. It, uh, there's been a document posted before the cutoff that addressed those. We just said, speak now if um, your comments on the previous version were not resolved. I'm asking if anyone has any last comments if not i'm going to push publication request when this meeting closes not seeing any nobody's jumping in chat right nope. okay and then that's the last thing so thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the meeting Yes. Knocking it out of the park.